So good evening, everyone. Thank you, Nanachem. And um, thank you to Limud New York, which in, in this journey, I know the word journey is so overused by now. It's Oprah-fied, but um, all of us are on one. And, and I would say that in terms of my own um, expedition, Limud New York has been, I think, a playground of learning and um, spirituality and awakening in a way I didn't expect. Um, it is you know, extreme sports Judaism for three days in the best sense. Um, and I'm grateful for everything I've learned and absorbed there. Um, and it's an honor to sit with, I have to be confessed, full disclosure, two of my parents' best friends, <laughs> Yitz and Blue, who have been in my life a long time, but I think became my teachers more in my adulthood. Um, and Yitz is in my book, um, you know, Thank Heaven. Um, and Blue has been uh, someone who I've relied on for many stories, um, including the one on the first Rabah. Um, which I did years ago, which was difficult to manage for New York Magazine, explaining halacha and also trying to understand the opposition um, that was so extreme at that time, and Blue was a great guide there. Um, so I think we want to touch on the themes of this night, this Taste of Limud, um, and I, I want to do that by, by being fairly specific with each of your kind of Jewish stories and, and what seems to me has organized your kind of Jewish orientation and priorities. Um, you know, most of us, or those of us who have been in therapy, I'm not asking, um, uh, we learn that it often comes down to the mother. It all, it all comes down to the mother. But for both of you, when I was doing my research, the fathers were really important in terms of, I think, your kind of Jewish spark and also some of the things you were reacted against or maybe thought to do differently. Um, so let me just start with Blue. Um, without going into the hole, because you know we're tight on time, we're going to be efficient tonight, um, and I want to get to the present moment. But in terms of your father, and, and again, giving us a sense of what it was like to grow up and how maybe he ties to your awakening later. Great. First, I want to say you also have been our teachers and helped Thank us you. greatly with our family. Thank you, Blue. Um, yeah. yeah, I was um, very close to my father. I love her. Shalom very, very special human being. And I, I always feel that he gave me, uh, he imparted a love of Judaism that was so powerful. And I think I brought that with me to my feminist critique of, the, of orthodoxy. Um, and even when I wrote some of my books, uh, some of my writings, I could hear my father's voice in the background. My father grew up very traditionally, and um, he, I wouldn't, I can't even say he came late to the ideas of feminism uh, integrated into Judaism, but on the way down, I was telling my husband and my daughter that when he disagreed with something, he would whistle. That was his way of <laughs> conveying. And then Yitz reminded me that my father would say, I know you didn't say that, or I know you didn't mean that, but, <laughs> He was a very loving father, and he, he did play a very tremendous role in my love of Judaism and my appreciation of it. My mother was very honest critique of everything she saw in life, so I grew up with my father who would never think of criticizing anything about the tradition, and my mother who would you know take no, no uh, prisoners, so to speak, and I think that the the combination of that um, total commitment and total faithfulness, and on the other hand, my mother's total honesty is really how I began to approach these challenges to orthodoxy. Thank you. Mitz, will you answer? Um, well, I, I mentioned in Jewish reintroduction, my mother had this elemental piety that had a very tremendously powerful, uh, my mother had this elemental piety which really came across. So uh, that's one, and the other being, she was sort of the rock of the family. She sort of, nothing stopped her, nothing intimidated her, nothing set her back. She never admitted anything was wrong or anything was a problem. She, you know, we just, we'll just do it. So I think that was her impact on me in the sense of I think it gave me some real sense of you, you stick to something, you just go ahead and 
you know, damn the torpedoes, just do it. Um, my father's impact was the primary one, first of all, because he was a incredible, he was a misnagator, for those of you who, who that's a foreign word, he, someone who, who total, Torah learning was everything, and, and anything else was nothing. I, I realized when I got older and realized that he had been an orphan, he, his father died when he was very young, and he was sent away to yeshiva, so he never really experienced family, but he experienced learning. And so, first of all, he communicated a tremendous love of learning and expectation of learning, and he learned with his children. I always said he learned with my sisters, not just with my brother and I. Uh, it wasn't a feminist, but it is just, uh, he, he didn't know any other way of expressing his love. So number one is that he really focused my whole life on sort of learning and studying and these things as something of extraordinary importance. The other impact was that I think he was in, in many ways brilliantly rebellious. <laughs> he, he loved Torah. He, he was a, a modern Orthodox uh, or a very traditional r rabbi, but he was he had very strong, passionate social justice feelings. Felt a lot of things were wrong in the Jewish community and in the leadership that he saw. He had a very strong sense of, of um, loving the Jewish people even against God, uh, and or, or at least uh, this is about finished with. So the ambivalence of affirmation and love and attachment, but criticism and challenge, as I think, implanted a kind of ambivalence or rebelliousness in me that has continued to shout with that story is that Joe Jalishan has written this in one of his books. When I was a teenager, my brother and I tried to do what was going on in the Orthodox community, turn right, you know, outflank our parents by showing that we're firmer than thou and, and kind of uh, began to do it now. It was a mistake because my father was 10 times the scholar, my brother and I, so other parents were intimidated, of course, and they would apologize and back down. He would, whenever we would say something more traditional, he'd say, oh, you're totally wrong, and he'd pull out the Talmud and pull out these things and show us we're a bunch of damn fools that the, the other position is the correct one. But you know, so after, after a uh, few months, we sort of gave up. We realized we're not going to get anywhere by trying to out from my parents. But somewhere near the end of that thing, and I was being a particular obnoxious, I began to talk about the Jewish people, how they're not observant, and they're all assimilating, and they're all Americanizing. It's terrible. And he like flashed. He lost his temper, sort of, which was very rare for him. He, he flashed and he said, How dare you? And I said, He said, How dare you speak about the Jewish people that way in the name of God? Because I was saying how God, in the name of God, think of their behavior in the last 10 years, 20 years. Who is more, who, is, who should be more ashamed of themselves? He said it very sharply and very quickly, but of course, I realized immediately that he meant the Holocaust. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I never quite got over it. I mean, it was like, it was like a, I needed that slap in the face, and I think it really turned me toward the direction that I ended up very much pursuing, which was defending the Jewish people and affirming their heroism, spiritual heroism, in the face of an incredible not abandonment, but in a case of an incredible disaster that was they were not saved from and not protected from. And I think it directed a lot of my religious thinking from that time on. Now, you, you described, though, that you didn't really have a, a, a Jewish home that was sort of meal-focused, the way m most of us think of, of Jewish families, that food wasn't a big, a big deal, learning was, and that Blue had to teach you that a bit in terms of building your life together. Um, you said that be, you know, kashrut was kind of lost on you because you didn't really care about what you couldn't, couldn't have. I'm not a foodie, but she, she loves every kind of food. <laughs> but he, he would like to have the same thing every day, for, which makes it easy for me, on the other hand. But no, food was an issue in his house, which was that his mother was very determined that he would grow big and tall, and she monitored his food intake very closely. But no, in my family, food was the center of family life. We sat down for dinner. Every, I remember I grew up in Seattle, Washington. My memory goes back to that. We sat down at 6 o'clock. Everybody came to the dinner table. We listened to the news until 6.07, and then we turned off the radio, and we had a family dinner. Whereas in Yitz's family, each child that came home from school was fed individually, so they wouldn't waste any time on family conversation. And, uh, <laughs> 
and not, and not take anything away from book learning. So, so once you were starting building your own family, five kids, am I right? Well, yeah, I have to say, yeah. she, she's being very nice about it now. <laughs> but the truth is, I was really unprepared for marriage because I had no idea what family life was like. We never had these meals, we never had these conversations. And I still remember the first time I showed up for dinner with my New York Times, I was gonna read the paper while we were, that's what I did. <laughs> So I was, we were raised as four single children, and therefore I didn't have anybody to talk to. I would simply read during, it was another way of, anyway, I showed up with the newspaper. <laughs> and that doesn't go, go doesn't go in. <laughs> well, I had a lot of other learning to do, and thank God she was very both, both patient and saintly. <laughs> and so eventually I grew up and uh, somewhat. And, and became sort of something of a husband. But anyway, but I, I think that was, and I must say also, I was, most of our cousins, most of my, rest, my parents, both my parents' family, the vast majority were wiped out in the Shoah, and I grew up without cousins. And again, it was sort of stunning to me when we got married how Blue herself had all these cousins, and then our children, and their, and it's been an amazing experience. But again, that was something that she was great at, and I had, it was a learning process. You've said that marrying Blue certainly transformed me, and I'm sure it was more than just not bringing the paper to the table. But in terms of how you decided to build a Jewish home, because one of the themes tonight is uh, what it means to be part of the Jewish community, we all make our own, we sort of start at home, right, with our own Jewish communities. Um, did you have a kind of a conscious decision early in your marriage about where kind of Jewish observance was gonna be, what the rhythm of your home was gonna be, was that, was one of you leaving that? Was it ever actually a conscious decision or it just unfolded the way um, more organically? I don't think it unfolded. I think we both came into, right. with the same expectations. We were both coming from the same levels of observance. I, I certainly, I married up intellectually, religiously, and every other way. So I had the, the, that great advantage. But we had basically the core values were the same, and I don't even think we ever discussed, you know, what we would, it was just a given. We were lucky enough to, uh, that thing, it is one of the rewards and blessings of being an Orthodox Jew, particularly in both families, I think, different ways, but it had really the, the best qualities and, and not many of what I, the qualities that I find very negative or, or rigid and so on. But, you know, so we experienced Shabbat and family. We expect uh, not as much as I didn't imagine that, but still, you 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 we took it for granted that you would have an observant home and things of that sort. And um, I think that was kind of a gift that uh, we never had to think twice about. The, the challenge becomes to create your own particular environment and your own particular experience. I, I never had, as me wrote in the house, blue had some, her father was totally tone, tone deaf, but, but he loves Mira. But he loves Mira anyway. Uh, but we, you know, so we, fed, we, had, we had a lot of hospitality, a lot of Zmiro, a lot of people visiting and talking around the table, and I think it helped. Right, Shabbat was really the, in both, we grew up in homes where Shabbat was the, the orientating event. I think it was Shabbat built our, helped build our family and help build our friendship circles and our choices of community. And in terms of when you began to kind of rock the world, become revolutionaries, how did that either affect the kids? Were they aware of it? Were there pressures um, coming from the outside when you began to get criticized from kind of within the, fa the Jewish family, the larger Jewish family? Would that be felt at the Shabbat table? were in your home, or were, were they kind of unaware of it? I should ask my daughter, who's sitting right over here, but <laughs> she's shaking her head. And I think that they didn't feel it so much for two reasons. One is that when, um, not too long after we were married, uh, Yitz became the rabbi of the Riverdale Jewish Center. And he was a very beloved rabbi of a growing congregation. So, even though some of the ideas that we were both beginning to espouse or to embrace were a little bit beyond where the community was. Uh, nevertheless, it, there was already a wonderful love relationship there. And I remember when I began to engage feminism, 
Uh, there were some people in the congregation in my community, which was my community of friendship, who, you know, liked those ideas or who, who uh, shared those ideas. But I would say probably the majority of the people in Riverdale at the time or in the Orthodox community in general at the time were, if not anti-feminist, then, uh, you know, dubious about it and suspicious of it, etc. But we felt we were, we were already part of a, of a, I use the word love again, we're parting, part of a love community. And uh, so we didn't feel the barb so much. It was very protective. And unlike your mother, who took you to every rally and, uh, you know, <laughs> involved you, I think I, personally, I think I tried to protect our kids so that they wouldn't be um, alien or outsiders in their own universes. So. I would counter that in two ways. One, one is, I think one of the smartest things we ever did, we used to bring them to the cloud programs, which means that they met a lot of non-Orthodox Jews and a lot of uh, very wide variety of Jews and a very wide variety of Jewish understanding. And I think they got it and they really appreciate it. I, I remember David, our number two son, once said to me, in the year they all go to Israel and they all flip out and become very holy. And now he said, one of the most powerful tools, one of the most powerful tools that the uh, teachers used to really get them to make this sort of right traditional swing was really to pit them against non-Orthodox Jews. And you know, say so reform Jews are assimilating and whatever, you know, giving them this whole talk, he said. And a lot of kids, it really had a powerful effect. But he knew personally, you know, not only Reformed Jews, but totally secular Jews, totally, who we knew were, A, were very wonderful people because they had first-hand contact, and B, very serious Jews and very important. So it totally just went off his back, and, and he felt that that, so I think that was a big factor that they picked this up. The other is that, again, thanks to Blue, uh, we, she found this place uh, as a house we could rent in the summers in Gloucester, Massachusetts. It was right on the ocean, magnificent place. And we would go away. At the beginning, I, when, I was, when I was an academic, it was for two months. And then when I became a rabbi, it began to shrink and more and more shrink. But the bottom line was we were there. Now, the house was totally not walking distance to any shul or any Jewish community. The nearest shul was, uh, was uh, like 10 miles away. But, so we made our own community that didn't always have a minion, but we would invite a lot of friends and a lot of company and our kids' friends. It became like, so that was an extraordinary experience because you had Shabbos squared or, or cubed. I mean, you had, the family was alone together, strong, and I think that sense of being together, making our own religious life and making our own religious uh, learning and these things together, really, I think, um, insulated the children. First of all, made them much more sympathetic to what we were doing and much less, the rest of the world hardly existed. So, I mean, it, it wasn't that they felt that there was a great army out there that were antagonistic. So I think that helped a lot. And you obviously have not just a, a marriage partnership um, and a family, but, but an intellectual partnership. Have there been times where you've pushed each other or held each other back or said, I think, it, I think you're going, I think this is one step too far, if you can be honest about that. Were there times where it almost was too far ahead for either one of you, what, what each of you were espousing or advocating in terms of change, in terms of uh, compromise, which is a word that you actually use comfortably not, and not necessarily many observant Jews do? Kitz was always way, way, way ahead of me. Even on feminism, I have to say, I came to it after he did. And um, you said he read the feminine mystique ahead of you. That's right, he did. He, he read it ahead of me. He uh, tried to convince the congregation to absorb some of those ideas. But I was always much more conservative, small c, and um, we had the same level of observance. But in well, she was Sam Ganawa's daughter, and so she was trying to right. so, keep me. <laughs> I, yeah, I try to keep him straight, but it, what I couldn't. But <laughs> no, uh, he definitely was more. Um, what do you mean he was ahead of you? Like, can you give an example? Yes, just in his ideas. Well, first of all, I grew up. I grew up in a fairly sheltered community, and he was a pluralist long before I even knew what the word pluralism was. And um, I have actually 
a couple of embarrassing stories, but I'll tell two very quickly. <laughs> when he, we were married, he was, became the rabbi of, um, the first year we were married, he was the Hilla director at Brandeis University. And the first time I came, er, I came early for, for the Rosh Hashanah services, and I went and sat down in a, in a, in a pew, or what do we call it, a, an aisle, a bench, and um, two minutes later, a young student came in, a male student came in and sat down next to me, and I had never seen anything like this in my entire life. So I waited three or four discreet seconds, and then I got up and I moved to another empty bench. And two minutes later, another young man came in and sat down next to me. I'm embarrassed to say that I waited a few discreet moments and I moved again. And the third time it happened, I gave up. I just sat there, but thinking, what, where am I? What have I come to? You know, but that was, uh, and uh, the other story I was remembering that we had often invited Klau families. Should I tell this story? It's so embarrassing. It's okay. This is a, <laughs> this is a safe space, Blue. <laughs> So we had uh, some. Uh, we had a Friday night dinner. We had uh, so several Klal families, and um, wonderful people. And our children really love these. As you said, they love these families. We also happened to have the same night. We had a Bnei Akiva um, meeting, which is the religious Zionist youth meeting in our home. So after our dinner, M, who was one of our Klal guests, uh, our house was that you had to walk through the, from the dining room through the living room in order to get to the front door. And in the living room were all these starry-eyed B'nai Akiva kids. And when our friend M got up to leave after dinner, she had this huge pocketbook, bigger than my pocketbook, huge green leather pocketbook. I remember it even though it's 30 years ago. And I said to her, would you mind going by, out by the side door? Because I didn't want her to walk with her pocketbook through the living room with all these innocent religious B'nai Akiva kids. And afterwards I told Yitz and our five children what I had done. I never got such a barrage of criticism on me. <laughs> every, one, every one of the children said, how could you possibly do that? You know, if, if our friends don't like her pocketbook on Friday, on Leil Shabbat, they should leave. That was like your mother, you know, they should, like my friend Bell used to say, they should get off the sidewalk, so. <laughs> yes, you were gonna say. Yeah, well, um, I think intellectually, first of all, I mean, theoretically, I thought about full equality for women, but Blue came along and in her inimitable way, you know, made it real and made it, applied it, and, and I mean, and I, I never thought of that. I mean, so I say in that sense, I think she's really remarkable and very different because she really turned what's an abstract idea into a living reality and all that. It's one example. The other example is even more important to me. Yes, I, I, I think I was, I must say, more rebellious and more, more, more demanding, maybe more less patient. When and as the feminism developed, and the truth is when I was the rabbi, I mean, I was in a very moderate and mild way, but not really fully. I think it took Blue and her inspiration to realize as far more implications than, you know, getting the women the Torah for Simchat Torah. That was not, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's a very, it's a very far from there, but I, I as it got developed, I began to realize more and more, you know, the real tension and the real deprivation and the real lack of equality. And at one point I said to, you know, I said, and the amazing thing, she's able to see all this, but has this amazing combination of love and patience, love for the tradition and patience. So it takes time, you have to let people grow into it, and you have to, and so at one point I said, to her, you know, I said, I'm willing to wait and I understand the point of your logic. I said, but you know, for me, it's no great effort to wait. I mean, till, until the Messiah comes, I'm, I'm totally privileged. I'm talking about white male privilege. I'm a rabbi, I'm a male, and I'm a Kohen. So in, in Jewish tradition, you know, so for me to wait is no patience, but you're sitting, you know, behind a mechitza, excluded, excluded. So I said, if so, anytime you tell me you can't take it anymore, you know, I'll follow you because it's not, it's not, it's not, it shouldn't be at your expense. Having said that, again, what struck me, amazed me, is despite 
not only the, the inequality, but despite the hostility and I thought in many cases totally unjustified negatives, that she would say to him, you know, she, she had the patience and the love to say, you, you, you got to let it happen, you got to push it. And I think it helped a lot with orthodoxy because a more aggressive feminism would have, I think, uh, really uh, backfired. backfired. But she has this totally disarming way of telling you something that totally demolishes the tradition, but it's said lovingly and patiently and kindly. And so you don't realize you just cut your head off, you know? And, and so people took it. And on the other hand, as I said, she was my model because I, I felt many times I would have gone much further, much less patiently. But you mentioned growing up, and, and, I, and you said this recently in another interview, that it's, it's time to grow up for the, I know you're talking about certain pockets of, of uh, Jewish, of Jews who feel attached, very attached to things being fixed. But you talk about that that's part of, of maturity, I think, of Jewish people. Can you address just in terms of where we are now and seeing how much change in your lifetime you've seen and yet how much is yet to change? And in some ways, things that have rolled back. I know it's a big question to sort of say, where are we? Um, but in terms of this growing up idea, how, how mature are we today? I think the most important thread of, that I've pursued, I mean, I, I still don't have a good answer. When I grow up, I'll know what to say. But um, is this idea that there is a maturation in the covenant. Let me rephrase that. In other words, I think in the history of Jewish religion, I think the core idea is this idea of tikkun olam, the messianic perfection of the world, done by a partnership between God and humanity and between God and the Jewish people in particular that work on it, that carry it out, that transform the world. What I came to see and come to believe is that there's a history here. And in the first period, which is now called the biblical period, a very dominant God and a very passive and a very immature almost Jewish people, childlike in many ways. The rabbinic tradition I came to see reflects the fact that the Jewish people grew up, and maybe in my language, that God self-limited, again, that's what covenant's about, is God self-limiting and inviting people to take over responsibility. And in this self-limit, the human God has to step up and take much greater responsibility, and the rabbis have a much greater, much more mature participation in Jewish religion than the biblical period. I mean, the Jew learns, the average Jew learns, the average Jew prays, not brings a sacrifice, and waits passively while it's said brought. One could go through hundreds of examples. The rabbis, God doesn't speak from heaven. The rabbis discern from the past what does God want from us today. That maturation, I think, was not complete. And, is, I, and this, I think, is the most important idea I've explored, although I haven't said, answered it, which is that I believe we're living through a third, the beginning of a third or a new era of Jewish history post-rabbinic, bluntly. Uh, it's, I think I've more and more come to think it's going to be called the lay, the lay period of Jewish history. That's for another conversation for another evening. But the maturation is, I think, that we're living in an age when God is totally hidden, when even hidden miracles don't happen. Thousands of miracles, millions of miracles happen, but they happen directly through natural law and through human agency. And this is what God wants. And this is what, so that, in other words, We've reached a stage where humans take responsibility for history. God is close, God is, accompanies them, God judges them, God loves them, but in the end, the humans are fully responsible. And if they don't do it, it's a disaster, which is what happened in the Holocaust, of course. So why am I saying this? The maturation of human beings, I think that's what we're living through in our period. The maturation meaning taking responsibility, understanding more profoundly the nature of reality and how you change it taking responsibility for not saying God will send a Messiah or God will do this, taking power and in all the challenges of taking power, ethics and the challenges of balancing power and limiting power, that's in our hands now. Now the Jewish people, I believe, is a role model. I'm, uh, obviously, after the helplessness and hopelessness of Shoah, Jewish people worldwide woke up and said we have to take power and became Zionist support Israel, create the state of Israel. But that maturation, I think, the whole world is going through. That's what modernity and post-modernity is about, humans taking responsibility. 
But, and this is where I think the issue remains, are humans fully mature or do we have in fact the problem of people carried away by their power, abusing it, environmentally abusing it, humanly abusing it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the answer I have is that I think the Jewish people is in some way maturing and taking responsibility and in the process of creating a new articulation of the tradition, but at the same time not fully mature and sometimes quite irresponsible, I, I, meaning the level of learning, the level of understanding, the level of serious effort is not enough. And that, to me, this has been one of the great challenges of the pluralism. In other words, to get the Orthodox to realize that it's not enough to simply repeat the tradition, that you have to take responsibility, and where you have to improve it, you have to improve it. And to get simultaneously liberal Jews who have been quicker to correct it and to, to take the mature responsibility of being able to do it competently and effectively, meaning deepening learning, deepening observance, deepening commitment. In other words, each group, I think, has a lot of unfinished work to do. And, and sorry, this turned into a whole speech here, but I'll finish with that. In other words, my answer is, are we more mature than before? Are we taking responsibility history more for? Absolutely. Are we fully responsible? Are we fully mature in our understanding and development? My answer is no. And there's a major unfinished job here, which is to grow up spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, take on responsibility. If I'm making all the important decisions, if I can make or break the world, then I, it seems to me I have to be better prepared and more serious in the effort. Um, and I want to get to Blue here, but just to follow up just a little bit on where does the, the, the line drawing and divisiveness within our community play into this third chapter? Um, the fact that, you know, I belong to a reform synagogue and I read um, the chief rabbi of Jerusalem say that reformed Jews are uh, evil and uh, the same as Holocaust deniers. Those are, those are strong words and those are recent. That's this summer. Am I supposed to just toss that off in terms of the sort of, the, it's, not, it's not just about me, it's about the messaging of that, that strain and how real you think that is for our community. Well, you're touching upon one of the frustrations of my life too. In these last 50 years, uh, orthodoxy mostly moved to the right in the opposite direction of where I thought they should move instead of toward the Jewish people and toward acceptance and internalization of the good values of the modern period that sort of moved into this Haredi withdrawal defensive posture. The chief rabbis are a class example. It's an immature Judaism. It's doubly immature in the case of the Haredi because the same chief rabbi who calls reform Jews Holocaust deniers and enemies of the Torah this same rabbi believes in a philosophy that you don't serve in the army. Why? Because God will protect you if you learn and keep Shabbat. I mean, talk about maturity and immaturity and irresponsibility. Talk about people who, in effect, have, have no sense of ethics of Judaism and are totally fixated on, on, on the ritual, their version of the ritual, which is a much more traditionalist, much more sexist, a much more undeveloped. So my answer is, I think, those comments reflect a, an immature, irresponsible, and really religiously deaf and dumb kind of a position. Now, how should I react as a liberal Jew? Well, I, I must say, I, as you can tell from what I just said, I'm not particularly a fan of the rabbi either, but, but having said that, I think part of being mature is to know when in their family situation, and particularly when in this case the state of Israel itself is at risk and at the constant attack, so the truth is that I will tolerate, or no, or no one is I'll fight and I'll argue, and I should. I, I didn't roll over, if my sibling is abusing me, I should speak up. But I, on the other hand, I wanna be very mature about not letting those kinds of fights destroy my relationship, not letting those kind of fights turn me against the whole system or blind me to the real objective needs and dangers and realities that Israel faces every day. So I would ask, to, I, ask the liberal Jews to do just that, to fight and I'll fight with them. I hope someday we'll convince more people. The only person who I really feel made the breakthroughs in orthodoxy is blue and feminism because they did make serious progress. But a large group, and of course, part of that has been her pluralism and getting Jofa and getting the orthodox feminists 
to be pluralist, whereas the men have gone much more into this isolationist position. So it's an unfinished work, and I think we have an alliance, or we should rebuild that alliance, and get more Orthodox Jews to speak up also. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's beyond embarrassment. It's a disgrace. When you think about it, the Haredi ministers agreed to that deal originally. It's just that their street, which is spoiled because it's gotten its way on every issue for the last 30 years, coming in to complain. So it's like, forgive me, it's like, um, what's his name? You know, uh, O'Reilly or, or what's the other? It's like Steve Bannon. You get criticized from these people, and instead of keeping your word, you, you run for cover. If they were mature, they would have said, look, we're sorry. You have to make some concession. The Jewish people worldwide is a major strategic asset of Israel. It's a major part of our family, you have to make some concession here. Instead of doing, which they did originally, because they knew that it was the right thing. But then they, as cowards, they turned and tail when they started getting criticizing from their street. So my answer is, again, I would hope that we could do this together and, and um, eventually uh, the day will come, <laughs> Israel will be fully democratic in this area, the religious area too. I want to, um no, echo that. It was very distressing to be in Israel at the time that all that news was breaking, and it was very distressing to see the, you know, as you said, the pullback and uh, violation of an agreement and, and the terrible words that were uttered, but it was also very distressing to read of the threat of withholding funds and support for Israel, uh, which was like, you know, it, if it was like a marriage that you know I'll just I'll just divorce you that was the, the sensation that uh, I I got when I was you know reading the paper so I think and part of it I felt guilty myself because I think modern Orthodox Jews should be a bridge community and certainly should have been a bridge community in that uh, whole and when you say bridge community you explain what you mean it, they should modern Orthodox Jews should have spoken out more vocally uh, in support of the space for, uh, for prayer at the wall and should have also spoken out more forcefully about reform and conservative Jews who were being bullied and delegitimated, but nevertheless should, and should have defended them, but uh, also critiqued them on saying they're gonna pull back their support in the end, I'm not even so sure whether that came, whether there were many liberal Jews who actually withheld their support. I don't know what the end story was, uh, but I, I also know that I don't think modern Orthodox Jews played the role that they, they could have and should have. You both have, have touched on the fact that one of the greatest challenges for our faith is moments of suffering, innocent suffering. And since you both talked about it and written about it, um, what you went through losing a son, when you, when you have um, people who are struggling in, a, in, a, in, their, in this modern moment with faith when something bad happens personally or in the world, can you help us have language for that, whether or not you want to talk personally or in, in anything that we've seen, even natural disasters, things where people say, how can there be a God if? Um, I know it's a big question, but I think you both speak so eloquently on it. Blue, do you want to begin? Well, I'll start because I think, and I'll be brief because it has much more to say on this than I do. Um, but I think the, my encounter with the Holocaust certainly challenged my faith. It didn't change my observance, but it certainly posed insurmountable theological questions. And by the way, it's, I, I, we're, I would say, we're, we're married for 60 years and it's been a fascinating ride for me to see how his thought has developed over the course of those 30 years and the influences on him, you know, and his new, different, new coming to new levels of understanding. I always say I'm the only person I know who can go for a 15 minute walk and with her husband in the evening and get five new ideas. So that's, that's always been very nice. Um, but I just want to say that I think that you said when you were talking before, you know, about that they didn't take power and as if you were, it sounds like, yeah, you have to be careful how you say that because it sounds almost like, 
you know, the Jews in, who suffered in the Holocaust, that they should have taken power. And it's just, I know you didn't mean that, but I'm telling you, that I'm saying that I think, we'll look at the tape afterwards and see where I got that. <laughs> but, um, so, that certainly has, I, I can't ever go through the davening, connect to the words, and not have Holocaust thoughts, have Holocaust challenges to the words in the prayer book. And, and yet in our own personal tragedy, which was the loss of our son, JJ, that never became, I never said, God, why did you do that? You know, it, it was, uh, I, I'm not sure why, uh, but I think what was the source of comfort for us was family and friends and community. That was a very powerful factor in our healing and integrating back into a normal life, even a normal family life, a normal community life. So I can't even, I can't explain it, but I, that's the phenomenology of it. Well, innocent suffering, of course, has been the classic, I think Rabbi Salvation once wrote that this is the burning unanswerable question for any religious person, uh, innocent suffering. Of course, the Holocaust raises it to a whole level, a whole ex extreme level that makes it even more com problematic. Again, Blue is quite right. I, I've, I've gone through at least three waves of trying to explain it, and in each case, I came up with another, still not happy. Of course, there'll never be an explanation, and I don't want an explanation, but my point is you have to take it seriously, and among the conclusions I came to personally was number one is that faith in our time, if it's serious and if it considers what happened, is broken. And I mean that in a good sense. Uh, it's a not whole, it's broken. And it's not absolute. It has elements of non faith. There are the moments you're reading or seeing these scenes in Hauschwitz. I, I, the one who, of course, that haunts me the most is the children being burnt alive because they wanted to save the money and not bother gassing them. Uh, in that moment, if you encounter it seriously, how can you talk, how can you feel, how can you even think of the idea there's a God? So my point only is not that I stop faith, but the faith is tempered, it's, it recognizes its limits, it recognizes the difference between the atheist and the believer as a matter of degree and not of kind. I mean, these are the, some of the implications of it. I also think it, at least in me, it evokes a, a feeling, and Brother Blue, of course, is quite correct. I didn't mean to say that. I'm saying the Jews would die because they were totally powerless. The Jews who revolted in the Warsaw Ghetto didn't help. They all died anyway. It's just, just a matter of choosing how you die. What I meant by the lack of power is that the Jewish people itself had no sovereign power. We could have, how many Jews could have survived if they could have gone to Israel? The Jewish people had no power, but the allies, including the democracies, and the bystanders, who are the main factor in all the countries of the Holocaust, when the bystanders stood up for Jews, like in Denmark, they saved Jews. Bulgaria, they saved Jews. When they didn't stand up, when they, uh, the Jews were killed totally. So my, that's my point, that we all learned that, not just the Jewish people. I always felt that feminism and civil rights movements all came after the war, anti-colonial movements, because people woke up and saw in the Holocaust that if you are at risk, if you don't have power, if you can't protect yourself, you're doomed. This is a world in which you have to be strong enough to protect yourself. And I think that's a healthy thing. Of course, when you get strong, you have to then limit it. So my point only is here that as a religious person, my main response was more and more that it's human responsibility to offset that cruelty with extra love, extra kindness, extra... I think it's no accident that the Jewish people, after the destruction, had the greatest outburst of life in Jewish history. After 80% of the rabbis in yeshiva were wiped out in the Holocaust, we have more people studying Torah full time than ever before in Jewish history. In other words, my point is, it's, I think God is close. I think God has lived through this suffering with us. I think that's a better understanding of God than the God who, didn't, who chose not to, or God forbid, those who say he punished us. I think that's not nonsense, it's obscene. So what really we're talking about it is that the God who shares all our experience 
can be with us, but we have to act responsibly and, and, and offset that. And that, to me, that is the great opportunity and challenge of our lifetime to, to create life, to, to create responsibility, great love, to create alliances, and not just for Jews, for the whole world, obviously. That seems to me is the great response to the Shoah, and that's the correct one. Um, I just want to um, end by, uh, I want to end positively, but start with sort of a negative uh, quote, or at least a pessimistic one that you offered recently at Hadar. I think it was very strong, at least for me. For the Jewish people, it's a very scary race between disintegration and renewal. And it's not a race that I think we're winning. In fact, we're probably taking heavy losses as we speak. So if you could each end with, in that balance between dis disintegration and renewal, can you give us some hope? We should let Blue end to that because she has this wonderful ability of optimism and hope no matter what, and God, uh, well, you know, the, Jew, the Torah will be eternal. I, well, of course, I'd like to hide behind the prophetic position, you know, which is you're going to be destroyed unless you repent. So when I speak of the disintegration, in part, I'm trying to get people to be scared enough to repent or change the policies. I think the Jewish community um, in America, when I started Klala, looking back now, I sort of feel, I basically feel my career is a failure, and not because it's all me and all dependent on me. But in 1972, three, when we started, we talked about a lot, Eli Wiesel, uh, we talked about it. You could see very clearly the coming acceptance of the Jewish people is gonna to lead to a massive you know, assimilation opportunity for Jews. And on the other hand, you saw in response to freedom and the right to assert yourself and be black is beautiful and Jews have a right to assert themselves, et cetera, that there was a real amazing chance for Jewish renewal and Jewish upbuilding. And so we talked about it, I said, you know, I can see there are two curves here. One is the curve of going that way. I hope if we succeed, we can raise the average level so by the time the two curves intersect, we'll have a large chunk of Jewish people with us. What I said in Hadar, because it's worried a lot, is I think the Pew studies suggest that the Jewish people did not uh, improve the infrastructure enough. Take birthright, which I consider professionally probably the most exciting thing we accomplished uh, at the Steinhardt Foundation. That's for college students. But when we started with the plan, the idea was that every stage of life, for adults, for children, early childhood education, for, for young children, day school and camps, et cetera, et cetera, that the community hasn't done. If it really wanted to meet the challenge of freedom and choice, you'd have to have a tremendous level of education and Jewish exciting experiences, religious and non-religious. The community did a very f small fraction of that, and what Pew suggests is that as a result, it's a competition, it's a free competition. Again, I don't believe the Torah should exist only in a shelter and in a ghetto. It's a free competition. Contemporary culture is a very exciting, very enriching, very powerful tradition. And I think a lot of Jews, because they're smart and because they have access and because they learn it, are joining it. And less are able to make this dialectical dynamic interaction and balance with the tradition. One of my anger about orthodoxy is that instead of helping the Jewish people do this, they created a shelter and left the other Jews sort of to their own, to suffer more and to, to be more assimilated. So make a long story short, it's not a lost cause. I believe whatever level we finally hit that curve where the curve of renewal, because it's real, continues, that that group, no matter how small, I think will hold its own and then rebuild. I may hope that's my dream. But I, I think if in the next 20, 30 years there was a massive effort, we'd get a lot more people to be in that camp when, the, when it comes. In particular, conservative reform, liberal groups, there's a, the Pew suggests a very bad demographic cliff is almost upon us, and I think those communities need help, and I would like to help them, but I think a major investment in an education, in upgrading experiences, et cetera, is needed. Otherwise, as I said, I'm not helpless, I'm not hopeless, but I, I think the level of the participation and the numbers of Jews that will make it to want to continue and be able to continue will be much less. So uh, that's my, you know, that's my cause to do something now.
I'll let you take us home, Blue, but we're not going to let you say that your career has been a failure. That not, this is not a room that will accept that, that sentence. It's, it's been extraordinary. Well, the, the operation succeeded, but the patient died, so that's not much of a consolation. I'm exaggerating, but I'm exaggerating, but I, I okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Cheer me up. So I read the statistics, so, and, you know, I, I cluck my tongue like everybody else does, but then on the other hand, I go into the street or I go into the community or I go to Israel or I, you know, and I, or I read the Jewish newspapers and I see that, and I, I sense a tremendous vitality. And um, so I haven't really, you know, gotten my, fix that orientation uh, to match each other. It's sort of discombobulating, but I do feel, you know, I, I sense in my life and my surroundings and my acquaintances and, you know, this, ongoing vitality, but even when I read the statistics, I'm actually not too threatened by them because I once had a teacher, a professor in graduate school who had, um, he was famous for what he called, what was called the lachrymose theory of Jewish history. The, and in every generation, it was like the blinking lights that kept going out, but then in another place, the blinking lights would, lights would come on, but I'm a great believer in the promise to Abraham, you know, that we would be an eternal people. It, I somehow integrated into my own social understanding, and I think there's no reason other than that promise that the Jewish people are alive and thriving today, or even that there's an Israel. When you do look at what we've suffered in Jewish history or the challenges we faced in Jewish history, and what a tiny people that we are and, you know, what our contribution to the world has been, you know, and the staying power of our faith and our tradition, um, I think it gives me great optimism. And so I do think we're going to be forever. I think the Jewish people will be alive and in varying degrees of health, but alive and a force unto eternity. Thank you both. Thank you all. Thank you so much. That was a perfect, perfect ending. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.